thank, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Hans. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and, and good morning for you uh, overseas. Um, I uh, will start by uh, by uh, giving uh, saying that uh, that I really appreciate this uh, opportunity to present. Uh, our work on uh, this uh, topic, which is uh, primary energy factors and how you determine, determine them. Uh, actually, many many of you probably consider a primary energy factor just uh, being a footnote in the EU energy policy, and uh, actually it, uh, it literally is, but uh, in reality, the, the determination of these factors and uh, the regulatory application of them they may uh, have a significant impact on the energy consumption and climate emissions and other environmental objectives uh, in, in the European Union. So um, uh, the, recently, the use of the PEF and uh, the calculation of the PEF and uh, other conversion factors have been heavily debated. And uh, the reason, of course, is that uh, when you apply, apply these factors in uh, a regulatory context, uh, it will distort the competition between electricity and other energy carriers uh, as well. So uh, some of you uh, may argue that we need these factors in order to compare primary energy efficiency resulting from different activities in energy and use sectors, while uh, others uh, may argue that uh, the regulatory application of a primary energy factor uh, is in conflict and, and or might be in conflict with the more long-term energy and climate objectives in the European Union. So uh, just to, to start by that last note, uh, this uh, slide you see uh, here, it uh, shows uh, a graph uh, that I've uh, taken from the EU Energy Roadmap 2050. And uh, as many of you know, this roadmap presents uh, five different future low-carbon scenarios. And uh, a common uh, aspect of all these uh, low-carbon scenarios is that they, uh, the, the share of electricity in final energy consumption has to increase tremendously in all of them uh, compared to the current trend scenarios. And uh, therefore, uh, some of you uh, raised concerns that uh, if we, uh, if we use a primary energy factor to influence uh, uh, final energy consumption, this might incentivize consumers to switch from electricity to gas, uh, uh, all while we need to, to do it the other way. So, uh, um, and uh, actually this is not, uh, we, we have been working on this uh, topic for a number of years and uh, I just thought I would mention that three years ago we uh, published a report on uh, conversion factors for electricity in energy policy and this report was contracted by Energy Norway uh, which is the Norwegian power industry organization. And in this uh, report we uh, reviewed regulatory application of uh, conversion factors. And a key message in this report uh, was that uh, if you influence electricity consumption through either taxes, uh, regulatory restrictions, labeling schemes, or, or other energy policy measures, this would be inefficient if your objective is to reduce primary energy consumptions or emissions associated with the generation of electricity. And the reason for that is that reduced electricity demand will indirectly punish all forms of generation technologies equally, and that's not just the technologies that you want to phase out of uh, the market. And uh, one of the key findings in the report is that, uh, of course, uh, the use of conversion factors may be justified for some certain statistical purposes, but uh, in general, the use of conversion factors should be avoided in a regulatory context uh, uh, if you have the possibility to regulate uh, energy or power generation directly and uh, through, through either support schemes or uh, emissions trading or, or, or other direct uh, energy policy measures. So, so that was the conclusion of that report. Now, uh, three years have went by, and uh, I think that uh, even though uh, many argue that uh, regulatory application of conversion factors is 
inefficient, uh, it also seems to be <laughs> un unavoidable. And uh, we see that uh, the use of conversion factors have, in fact, been introduced in a number of areas, uh, such as uh, life cycle analysis and, and uh, social accounting. Uh, of course, uh, they have, uh, many have used uh, conversion factors uh, for those purposes for, for many, many years. But uh, recent years, uh, the conversion factors have also been introduced in uh, a series of uh, standards, international standards and European standards, and also in uh, European uh, energy policy. And uh, for instance, in the, in the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, the Energy Labeling Directive, the uh, Eco Design Directive, and, and also, in fact, the Energy Efficiency Directive uh, from 2012. And, um, and many, many, as, as I mentioned, many argue that electricity factors uh, discriminate uh, electricity and, uh, because it distorts the competition between electricity and other fuels. And uh, as an example, I have, uh, you see in this slide, an excerpt from a brochure uh, from the Confederation of Norwegian Enterprise, uh, the European Association of Electrical Contractors, and other European business organizations as well, where they argue that uh, that uh, regulatory application of uh, of uh, primary energy factors should be avoided. And uh, there has, uh, as also Hans mentioned in his introduction, there has been a debate regarding the use of uh, primary energy factors. And, and this debate has, in fact, suffered from the lack of a common or universal mythology or determination approach. And uh, that leads uh, us to, uh, to our mandate or our assignment for the study that we have uh, conducted. And uh, the, the purpose of the study was uh, firstly to, to establish principles and, uh, and a framework for determining uh, uh, primary energy factors and, and also other forms of conversion factors for electricity drawn from the electricity distribution grid. And uh, also, uh, we were to discuss the use of uh, conversion factors and uh, the framework in the report in the context of EU energy policy. And uh, uh, for, for your information, uh, I should mention that the study was contracted by uh, the Confederation of Norwegian Enterprise, Energy Norway, as well as uh, NELFO. And NELFO is uh, the, the trade uh, association for technical entrepreneurs in, in Norway. Now, uh, the, the focus of the report is, uh, of course, uh, determining primary energy factor, but the methodology may be applied to any form of externality and not, not just primary energy consumption. And uh, as you probably know, externalities uh, is defined uh, or, or is, uh, is uh, the uh, externalities are costs or benefits that affect a party who did not choose to incur that cost or, or benefit. And uh, examples of externalities might be pollution or, or waste generation. Now, in uh, the literature, externalities are uh, often divided into three categories. So we have the economical externalities, we have the environmental externalities, and also social externalities uh, such as uh, equality and poverty and, and human rights and, and, and such. And uh, many of you may recognize the mythology that we present in the report. And that is because we have tried to derive the mythology from a number of relevant European and international standards. However, many of these uh, uh, mythologies or, or the framework that we have, uh, have identified uh, is uh, incomplete. And uh, therefore, we have tried to, to establish a complete framework by supplementing these widely accepted principles in existing standards with strengthened guidelines that we have uh, tried to ground in, in uh, traditional economic theory. Um, moving on. Uh, uh, the overall framework structure in the report is actually divided into two parts. And the, this, uh, we, we have divided it into these two parts, uh, reflecting the two main criteria that we had 
we have uh, laid down and concerning the, the determination of the primary energy factors. Now, uh, the first uh, criteria is that the primary energy factor should be accurate and uh, goal-oriented. And by, by this, we mean that the, the primary energy factor uh, must be suitable for the concrete objective or energy policy target that one aims at reaching. For instance, if the, if the goal is to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, it may be more accurate to calculate uh, an emissions factor for electricity rather than a primary energy factor. Now, now so the, the part one of the methodology or the framework aim, attempts at making the primary energy factor accurate through a number of, of principles. Now, part two of the uh, methodology or the framework attempts to ensure that the primary energy factors has sufficient precision. And by this, we uh, imply that the calculation of the primary energy factor must not deviate too much from its true value, uh, making it insignificant. So, so the primary energy factor should be precise enough that it is representative and suitable for its intended application. And uh, so part two attempts to ensure that the primary energy factor has sufficient precision via establishing uh, guidelines for the detailed uh, calculations. Now to, uh, I will start with uh, going through the, the first part of the framework, which is uh, the overarching uh, principles. And this part consists of four steps. Uh, where you have to make some choices. And uh, always keep in mind when making these choices, uh, one should reflect on the overall objective that we try to, to reach. What, wh why do we, uh, for what purpose are we going to apply this conversion factor? And uh, the first step of uh, part one is to select the appropriate assessment approach in determination of the primary energy factor for electricity. And there are, in fact, two approaches available. And the, the choice of the uh, assessment approach should, as I mentioned, reflect the purpose or the goal that we seek to accomplish. And uh, the two uh, approaches are the attributional assessment and the consequential assessment. Now, the attributional assessment uh, implies to allocate real or, uh, or expected primary energy consumption associated with the production of electricity to the end user consumption of electricity. And uh, this uh, approach may be suitable for a number of purposes, uh, for instance, in uh, climate reporting, uh, environmental reporting, and statistical benchmarking. Now, the other assessment approach is the consequential assessment. And uh, this requires the investigation of changes. Uh, this approach uh, tries to uncover to what extent changes in the end user consumption of electricity results in changes in the primary energy consumption. And a relevant application for this methodology could be to uh, investigate to what extent um, electrification of European transport would have, uh, what kind of impact that would have on overall European primary energy consumption. And uh, therefore, a consequential assessment uh, is normally suitable for, for decision-making processes. Uh, after uh, selecting the, the assessment approach, uh, no, actually, I, I'm going, uh, I, I think well, I will dig a little bit deeper into the, the assessment approach uh, by providing you with an example and uh, to, to explain the difference between the different the two approaches. And uh, this example uh, stems from the transport sector. And uh, I've actually uh, made the example uh, on, on climate gas, greenhouse gas emissions. And, and uh, the example uh, is an, a person who is trying to decide whether she will travel with her own private car or whether she will rely on uh, public buses. And uh, her overall aim is to minimize total greenhouse gas emissions. Now, as you see of the, the table here, uh, the table uh, provides an overview over the greenhouse gas emissions associated with both the private car, uh, a bus with five passengers, and a bus with 
30 passengers. And the table is uh, based on the assumptions that the, the bus and driver emits uh, 1,500 grams uh, greenhouse gases uh, per, uh, or CO2 emissions uh, per kilometer, and uh, that the private car emits uh, uh, 150 grams uh, per uh, kilometer. Now, um, uh, for, for each passenger that uh, goes on the bus, the emissions from the bus will increase with five grams per uh, kilometers. Now, according to this table, you see that uh, if the person wants to minimize uh, greenhouse gas emissions, she should choose to travel by bus uh, because the bus will be out on the road cons uh, emitting greenhouse gases regardless whether that uh, person would choose to use her car or, or not. And uh, if the person uh, chooses to travel by bus, emissions will only increase by five grams per kilometer. If she chooses to use her own private car, the emissions will increase by 115 grams uh, per kilometer. So uh, on the other hand, if, uh, if her objective is to, to make a report over her, her own uh, greenhouse gas emissions, then she might choose the attributional approach. And you see that uh, she will take responsibility of, her, of uh, her share of the greenhouse gas emissions, which, uh, again, is dependent on the number of passengers on the bus. Uh, now, uh, after uh, selecting the assessment approach, the next uh, overarching principle is to choose the, or clarify the, the calculation indicator that is best suited to the overall purpose. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, in this report, uh, we, we focus on the primary energy factors, but uh, other, other factors might also be applied, uh, uh, dependent on what is the overall objective. And for instance, uh, one objective might be to reduce primary energy consumption, and another objective might be to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. And uh, if, you, uh, if your objective is to reduce uh, primary energy uh, consumption, then uh, primary energy factors might be, be suitable. But it is important to stress that uh, primary energy factors and CO2 factors cannot be used interchangeably in order to meet multiple energy and climate related goals at the same time. And uh, for instance, if, uh, if we choose to, uh, to uh, if, if we have a gas powered plant, which has uh, maybe a primary energy factor of, of 1.8 and the CO2 emissions of 350 grams per kilowatt hour, we might choose to, to retrofit this plant with carbon capture and storage. And uh, as we know, uh, primary energy consumption in those plants will increase by approximately 30%. Uh, all the while uh, emissions will be uh, be captured. So about 90% uh, of emissions might be captured in, in, in uh, CCS installation. Now we see that by retrofitting this installation with, with CCS, uh, primary energy factor will increase, which is uh, it's not good if your overall objective is to reduce primary energy consumption, but CO2 emissions will decrease significantly, which is a positive thing if the, if the overall objective is to reduce emissions. Now, another example would be to, um, to, uh, to phase out the gas power uh, plant and, and, uh, and commission a nuclear power plant. And of course, uh, uh, primary energy consumption will increase uh, further and, and CO2 emissions will, will decrease even, even more. So, uh, so uh, you have to uh, you have to clarify the indicator. You have to choose the indicator that best fits the purpose of uh, or, or the overall objective uh, for the, the determination of the conversion factor. Uh, and I just uh, I have an example here where you see from uh, from Forbes magazine where where uh, uh, which gives an example that in the U.S. they they. Uh, try to fight climate change uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, pushing forward a nuclear power production. And, and of course, that will increase primary energy consumption, uh, but, but emissions will decrease. And uh, here you have a, a table which shows you that uh, all different forms of, uh, of uh, 
power plant uh, technologies uh, might uh, are characterized either by a low or a high uh, CO2 factor or a low or a high primary energy factors. So, um, so we see that uh, several production technologies have low emissions, even though they require a large amount of primary energy. And similarly, uh, some technology release large amounts of greenhouse gases, all while they require a small amount of, of primary energy. In the, in the production of electricity. So uh, that was the, the second step. And the, the yes, uh, and the, as I mentioned, you should choose the, the, the indicator that is best suited to the overall purpose. And that might be a CO2 factor. That might be a primary energy factor. And there are all others, uh, conversion factors as well, such as the rest share, energy cost, emissions of radioactive waste. And of course, you have variants of these uh, uh, indicators. Uh, you have, for instance, uh, the uh, renewable primary energy factors, total primary energy factors, fossil energy factors, and so forth. So you have to, to choose the correct indicator. Now, uh, moving on, uh, the third uh, step is to identify uh, the system limits. And that is, uh, Number one, you have to identify the ge geographical area for which we want to investigate the relationship between the consumption of electricity and primary energy consumption. And uh, the choice uh, of uh, the ge geographical area should uh, reflect the overall objective. And we might also uh, delimitate the, the sector that we try to uncover uh, the relationship between consumption of electricity and, prim and primary energy consumption. For instance, are we looking at the primary energy consumption just within the power sector? Are we looking at uh, the changes in in all of the in the all of the ETS sectors, for instance, or or the all sector as a whole? We have to we have to establish some form of system limits. Now, the, the uh, fourth and final step is to establish a time frame. And uh, this is very important because we need to identify a period of time over which uh, we try to determine the primary energy consumption. And the time frame, again, it should reflect the overall objective. For instance, if we, uh, if, uh, we have given some examples here in this table. And if the objective is to, uh, to make an annual uh, energy report, we might, uh, we might uh, uh, base our report on uh, historical production data. However, if our objective is to reduce future uh, primary energy consumption, for instance, to meet an energy efficiency target in 2020, then we should try to, to uh, determine future production data that are, should be expected in, in, uh, in the future. Uh, yes. <clears throat> now, um, so, so that was the first part of the framework. And, uh, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, the framework is divided into two parts. And uh, uh, Actually, the, the, the second part of uh, the framework has been divided into two different uh, parts, uh, the part 2A and the part 2B, 2B depending uh, on whether the attributional assessment or the consequential assessment methodology is, uh, is uh, selected. And uh, so, so uh, if you have uh, selected the attributional uh, assessment approach in uh, step one of part one, then you should uh, look into part 2A to, to, uh, to perform the detailed calculations of the primary energy factors. If you have chosen the consequential assessment approach, you should uh, look into part 2B, which is the detailed calculations for consequential assessment approach. So I will, I will uh, shortly move through these two, uh, the guidelines in, in each part. Uh, uh, yes. And, uh, and here you see um, uh, an overall uh, view of the, all the steps in, in, uh, the, in, the, in the, or the complete uh, process of determining uh, primary energy factor. 
uh, if you choose the attributional assessment approach. And as you can see, the part two, which is the light orange colors, is an expansion of the, the overarching principles in part one. And, uh, and uh, yes, and, um, and uh, as I mentioned, the aim of uh, part two is to ensure that the primary energy factor is precise, making it suitable for its in intended uh, application. Now I will, uh, uh, I will uh, move you uh, through the, the, the four steps of, of part 2A. Now, uh, step 5 of the process, or step 5A, uh, is to select the allocation of, uh, the, uh, to, to select the, the suitable allocation uh, mechanism. And uh, there are, in fact, two uh, allocation mechanisms. You have the physical allocation mechanisms and the, uh, the, the financial allocation mechanisms. I, I seem to have, have some internet uh, problems here. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, as I mentioned, there are two main allocation mechanisms that uh, might be applied uh, in the determination of the primary energy factor. And the first is the physical allocation mechanism. And the physical allocation involves the allocation of uh, primary energy or, or other externalities according to the physical flows of electricity as uh, seen by, by the, the figure in this slide. Uh, we see that uh, in uh, electricity power market one, uh, primary has a primary, a primary energy factor of two, and, and it is allocated uh, where, where, where uh, it, the production of one gigawatt hour of electricity requires two gigawatt hours of primary energy factors. And we see that we allocate the consumption of primary energy according to the physical flows of the market. Now, uh, the, the next uh, allocation mechanism uh, is the financial uh, allocation mechanism. And uh, in, this, uh, in this allocation mechanism, we detach the allocation of primary energy from the physical distribution of electricity. And uh, this allocation may instead, uh, instead of uh, physical flows, it may be uh, conducted according to financial flows or, or flow of financial papers such as uh, guarantees over regions or electricity certificates or, or other financial, uh, financial papers. And, uh, and these uh, financial papers are, uh, may be traded in a separate market from the physical market. And uh, one example is illustrated in this figure where we see that, uh, which is the, um, it's the European market for guarantees of origins, where uh, we see that in consumers may influence their primary energy consumption uh, via, the per, per, uh, via the purchase of such uh, environmental uh, or, or purchase of guarantees of, of origin. So, so we have to. Uh, so step five is to select the, the allocation mechanism. Now, uh, the next step is uh, to uh, to identify the uh, electricity mix for the calculation. And as you can see by this figure, uh, there are several uh, several uh, prerequisites, prerequisites that you have to take into account when identifying the electricity mix. For instance, you have to take into account the, the system limit. Are we looking at the electricity mix in a national perspective or a European perspective, for instance? Also, we have to um, uh, look at, uh, uh, look at the, um, uh, the, the time frame. Uh, when is it, a, is it a historical time frame? Is it a present time frame? Or is it a future time frame where we have created a scenario for the future? And also, we have to take into account the, the allocation mechanism. And, uh, and uh, by doing so, you should be able to identify uh, the mix of different generation technologies, uh, renewables, uh, fossil fuels, nuclear power, etc., that is in the electricity mix that you will uh, base your uh, primary energy factor on. 
And uh, the next step is to identify, uh, I'm sorry, yes, uh, the next step is to identify uh, the primary energy consumption associated with the different production technologies in the, the electricity mix that you have uh, already identified. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you have to, you need uh, access to data uh, about uh, how much primary energy consumption uh, is associated with different uh, production technologies. And uh, there are many uh, sources of that kind of information. For instance, uh, here you see a report from uh, the International Energy Agency, uh, which gives statistics on, on uh, efficiency performance of, of uh, coal power in, in different areas of the world. Also, there are uh, many databases that have these kinds of uh, data, for instance, uh, the eco -invent. And uh, when uh, trying to identify externalities associated with the electricity mix, you also have to, uh, in the detailed calculation, consider whether or not you should uh, focus on uh, externalities associated with with only the, the, the generation of electricity, or you want to look at the whole life cycle uh, phase, uh, such as uh, the recovery of energy fuels, the transportation of energy fuels to the power generation facilities, the, the commissioning and decommissioning of, of power plant uh, uh, generation facilities, and, uh, and of course, uh, the distribution of electricity through, through the grid. So either you might uh, focus uh, on, on one part of the energy value chain, or you, or you might want to include the whole life cycle. Now the last uh, and final step uh, is to, the, to calculate the primary energy factor. And uh, the primary energy associated with uh, each uh, electricity production technology in the identified electricity mix should be multiplied with uh, its share in the total electricity mix. And, uh, and here I just, uh, in this table, I have given you examples from, uh, from Norway uh, from 2014. Uh, we see, we, <laughs> as you might know, Norway is uh, it's almost, uh, we, we have uh, a very high share of uh, hydro uh, power generation and, and some wind and some natural gas, uh, giving us uh, an average of uh, a primary energy factor of uh, one 0.02 in, in this example. Uh, now, the, this, uh, this part 2B of the uh, framework is uh, determining PEF calculations in a consequential assessment based on a consequential assessment approach. And uh, as uh, part 2A, you see that uh, there are uh, some uh, steps uh, in the detailed calculation. And these steps uh, are, uh, are, um, are follows the, the four uh, over, uh, overarching principles that we already uh, established. Now, in this, uh, in this uh, in this approach, uh, we try to, uh, to identify how a change in the end use of electricity has an impact on primary energy consumption. And uh, when assessing changes in electricity production due to changes in the consumption of electricity, it is important that we manage to establish a complete understanding of all the elements that influence the behavior of power generators. And uh, of course, changes in the consumption of electricity is only one of several elements that influence power production. Of course, they respond to uh, consumer uh, demand, but also they, they adapt their behavior to uh, energy policy measures and, uh, and also, of course, the production cost. So uh, the first uh, step in the detailed calculation is to identify what are the relevant regulatory measures that influence power generators and that we have to take into account uh, when, when determining the consequential primary energy factors. And uh, of course, uh, there may be many different regulatory measures that are relevant. Uh, there may be concession procedures that uh, restrict, for instance, the uh, commissioning of nuclear power in, in a country, uh, emissions permits that influence uh, power generators, 
Uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, emissions trading, electricity quota system, uh, taxes and subsidies as well. So we have to identify what are the relevant regulatory measures that influence power generation. Now, the next step is to identify the marginal changes in electricity production caused by changes in electricity demand. And of course, there are, uh, as I mentioned, there are, uh, are um, uh, as, you, as you saw in, in, uh, in uh, the decision tree, there are many uh, prerequisites uh, that, uh, that uh, determine uh, what the marginal changes are. So of course, we have to look at the, the ge geographical limits, the system limits. We have to look at the time frame, and we have to take into account the regulatory measures. And this uh, uh, step of the methodology is characterized by a high level of complexity. So in addition to these prerequisites, the calculation also depends on access to data on demand elasticity, generation capacity, uh, production costs, cross-border uh, cross trade, uh, electricity prices, uh, uh, etc. Uh, so, so, um, uh, so, so, of course, uh, when, when trying to identify marginal changes in electricity production, you might be depend on uh, energy or electricity market simulation software in order to, to gain some kind of real, reliable uh, results. Now, there are many uh, software solutions available to the market. The European Union uh, relies often on the Primus model, and there are other many other uh, market models available uh, also. So um, uh, one thing you have to take into account when, when trying to identify marginal changes in electricity production is demand elasticity. And uh, this is, uh, might be different uh, depending on uh, whether the change in electricity is, uh, is, uh, is just uh, a, a short uh, term thing or, or the uh, change in electricity also is, uh, has a long-term uh, effect. For instance, if there is a heat wave in, uh, in Europe, uh, increasing electricity uh, uh, demand, then, then it will not affect electricity consumption in the long term, and power generators will not adapt to that change in the long term. Now, if uh, the demand is lowered, for instance, in the long term due to uh, some kind of restriction on electricity consumption or, or an electricity tax, then uh, that might uh, be a permanent thing, uh, and thus uh, the power generators will adapt to that change in, 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 the, in the long term, and which in the long term might lead to, uh, to reduced investments in new generation. Uh, capacity. And, uh, and uh, also one thing uh, you might have to consider uh, when making these calculations uh, is, demand, uh, is demand elasticity and, and, and the rebound effect. Now, uh, as you know, uh, you might, uh, we might uh, 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 establish a, a, a tax on electricity that reduce electricity and generate uh, a lot of electricity savings. Now, we know that uh, these electricity savings will reduce the price of electricity. Uh, so in fact, the, uh, the use of electricity might increase for other purposes or other applications. That is what we call the rebound effect. And that is also something we must have to take into account when trying to identify marginal changes in production caused by marginal changes in, in consumption. So uh, if we manage to, to identify marginal changes in uh, production, then we are also, next step is to calculate the externalities associated with this uh, change. And uh, as uh, similarly for the attribution approach, we have to find some uh, trustworthy uh, sources of information in order to identify these externalities. And the final step is to multiply uh, the primary energy per kilowatt hour for each production technology in the uh, identified with the share of each technology that uh, in, in the marginal electricity production mix. 
Now I see that I'm I'm uh, running out of time, so uh, so uh, just uh, to, to uh, I have a few slides just uh, where where we consider this framework in the context of uh, EU uh, energy policy. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, there uh, the primary energy factors has been applied in a series of uh, uh, EU energy policy legislative acts. And, uh, and we have we discussed the use of uh, the primary energy factors in these different uh, legislative acts. And, the, and one key finding is that uh, in the energy efficiency directive and the in, in energy performance of buildings directive, the use of uh, primary energy factors is uh, voluntary, and the member states may apply national uh, factors if, if they want. Now, uh, the Eco Design Directive and the Energy Directive has a different approach as it uh, imposes the use of primary energy factors on a pan-European level. So, uh, so all, all member states have to make use of these conversion factors, for instance, in when, when uh, uh, placing eco or making energy uh, performance requirements on uh, uh, boilers uh, and, and combi boilers they apply a conversion factors of electricity uh, in order to compare it, for instance, with, with uh, gas boilers. Now, this, uh, the conversion factor uh, is, is defined as a coefficient reflecting the estimated 40% average EU generation efficiency referred in the energy efficiency directive. And we know that this 40% uh, average is uh, derived from uh, uh, EU energy statistics from actually the year was 2004. Now we applied the framework uh, in the report to uh, these uh, conversion coefficients in eco design and energy labeling and, and tried to uh, at least give some uh, overarching principles uh, or, or some recommendations for, for what the overarching principles should do. And we see that uh, the first overarching principle, choice of assessment approach, we, we see that uh, the EU conversion factor is based on an average factor, average uh, EU generation efficiency. And, the, uh, and uh, all while the purpose of the directive is to reduce future primary energy demand. So our recommendation is to change that to the consequential assessment approach. Now the next principle is uh, to clarify the indicator, and uh, of course they use the conversion efficient, which only reflects generation efficiency. Uh, while our recommendation is that you should also look at energy losses in in the distribution grid, and therefore it might be more appropriate to apply a primary energy factor. And uh, they have the system limits. They have calculated this from the EU in uh, 2004, when there was only 25 member states. Now uh, the EU has expanded, and also the, the eco-design and energy labeling requirements applies to the whole European economic area. So we recommend that the, the, the system limit uh, is, is uh, the whole, the whole uh, economic area. And finally, the time frame, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the EU conversion factors is uh, it's 2004. Now, since given the fact that uh, the energy labeling and eco-design directive has uh, a target of, of reaching EU 20% uh, primary energy savings in 2020, we recommend that, that they use a future uh, generation mix and, and future data or, 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 or make a scenario for, for how the generation mix will be in, in the future. Yes. So, so that was uh, that was the, the the final conclusions of the of the report. Now, uh, I give the word to you, uh, Hans, and you will maybe uh, moderate the Q and A for this session.